Shut up and sit down. Everybody, it's the Takeover Tuesday podcast, and we're minus Carlos again, but we're going on with it. And here today, we have someone from across the pond, all the way from Ireland, the evil bald genius, John McCullough. John, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Yourself? I am fantastically uh, mediocre and a bit sick, but other than that, <laughs> <laughs> other than that, we're soldiering on. <laughs> Excellent. So. Uh, John, tell us a bit about yourself for people that maybe are not as familiar as I am with you. I've been on your email list for quite some time, several years, and uh, I know a bit about you, but uh, for people who, who don't know exactly who you are, uh, maybe give them sort of a brief overview and uh, we'll go from there. I tell you what, if you've been listening to me for several years, you must have a very thick skin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah well, um. <laughs> I'm actually English. I, I moved over to Ireland about 10 years ago and I set myself up on this little farm. I got a shed with a cave in the garden and I'm basically a small, I call myself a small business advocate because if you call yourself, if you say you're into marketing, people will quite rightly get the wrong impression. I think you're some kind of sleazy little shitbag. Um, so basically I just help small businesses make more money, usual kind of stuff, Dan Kennedy style marketing. Um, most of my clients are in, this U uh, in the UK. A few here in Ireland and a few across the water as well. It's all fairly boring, really. Nothing, nothing outrageous, unfortunately. Right. But you have a, a bit of, to some people, I mean, uh, I rather enjoy it, but to some people, you, you have an outrageous personality. I have been told this, yes. <laughs> uh, it, it, it was a decision I made years ago. I was, was, that's before I moved here to Ireland. And I was, I was doing the usual kind of stuff, you know, going to BNI and all the things that you're supposed to do in business. And it just wasn't working for me. Not only was I not enjoying it, I just felt like I was, I was just pretending to be someone I wasn't. And uh, after a, a while, I've, I kind of found Dan Kennedy and things got a bit better. But things didn't really change until I thought, uh, just leave, uh, fuck it, I'm just gonna do what I wanna do, do it my way. So I just, I started swearing every five minutes like I do in real life. Um, I dropped any pretense at all. I just started being myself and you know, things just worked out. A lot of things worked out really well for me. And now I've attracted the kind of people in my, towards my business, the kind of people who are in my business as clients and, and customers, really. They are people much like me because I've got my, my bullshit filters, my email filters. They're all set up so that people who are faint hearted, lily livered type of people, they just don't get through. Um, they, they drop out, which is great. So my yeah. life does not suck. <laughs> no, it definitely doesn't seem to. And you seem to have found your audience. Yeah, that's true. Now, we've had people, we talked about this briefly on the last show that we recorded, but uh, one of the things that, that has amazed me about starting this podcast and having different people on, because this sort of gives me license to have all the people that I admire, of course, uh, if possible, come on this show and talk to them. And we've had a few people that uh, fall into that cat those th couple categories you just listed there, the lily-livered, uh, whatever you mean. Now, I'm... I'm by no means, I don't think I'm as far to the uh, extreme as you are probably uh, personality wise, but I definitely am sh a bit shocked that uh, people have refused to come on this show. Carlos likes to swear normally uh, quite a bit. We have swearing on this show, but there's been some people who've opted not to come on because of the uh, that factor. So I'm sure you've had encountered uh, some of these things in your marketing career too, where you're <coughs> up against oh, yeah. people. I've had people email me and, and, and I'm, you know, I'm not talking about other marketers here either, people that you might listen to. I'm, I'm talking about business owners who are looking for marketing advice. They have no knowledge or experience, yet they still seem, they, just, they still see fit to give me advice. You will do better if you swore less. Right. Uh, no, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> you tried like, there, that. <laughs> there's a fucking reason for it. Yeah, I tried that. There's a reason for it. It's not just ignorance. It's not just blind stupidity. Right. I think it comes across too because you're, you're. That's who you are. I mean, it's uh, you're not you're not trying to put on something and be more polite. That would be putting on airs or whatever you want to say. For you, it's just like here's who I am and here's what what I like to do. Well, yeah. I mean, the way I describe it, explain it to people is the last thing I want to happen is for someone to go through my email list 
uh, and then you know maybe buy a couple of products or something, and then come all the way over to, to Cork in Ireland to come to a, a thousand pound boot camp or a two thousand pound boot camp, and then leave after you know a morning because I'm swearing a lot, and this isn't the person that you were on your email list because there's no way on earth I'm going to get up on in front of an audience and at my own boot camp and just pretend to be someone else. So I might as well just cut it off at the pass and just start right from the beginning and show, show it all right from the start because that, otherwise it's, it's just a waste of everybody's time, you know, getting people in and then having them leave. Yeah. Now, uh, you may have better insights. You've been doing this a lot longer than I have, but you may have some insight toward this. Are the people, have you found it, because it's kind of a filter, you're a, you're a polarizing personality, obviously. Some people will like you, some people don't like everybody. But have you found that there is a difference between people who will actually take your advice, you know, and uh, your marketing advice or whatever, and versus people who come to you who are a little, maybe, uh, you know, still on that side of like, I'm not sure about this guy who, who's swearing and, and, and outrageous, uh, as to will they follow through with the advice? Have you found any sort of correlation with that? Um, yeah, I think the, the people who are more like me, so they're more like to swear themselves, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because there's a whole gamut of things, man. I'm a diehard libertarian atheist as well. So the people who are more like me and share more of my views, they're more likely to take my advice. That's not to say that everybody's the same. I mean, in my elite group, uh, we meet in Cork every three months. Um, and we have, uh, we, we're a very close knit group. And one of the, the ladies there, she's, uh, actually a fundamentalist Christian. But she puts up with me because she does value the advice. So there are exceptions. But for the most part, people who people fall into the trap, the very human trap of because they don't like the messenger, they won't listen to the message right. effectively. And that's very, very common. Um, some people have even said it. They've, they've actually come out and said it. Well, if you're so stupid that you will swear and um, say this kind of thing on your emails to a commercial business list then you can't know what you're talking about. I mean, you know, I don't even bother <laughs> arguing with these people. I just don't. Right. There's no point. Not with your time. Now, let's go back a bit. And uh, how did you get into all this? Where were you before you became the evil bald genius, before you became a marketer? And sort of take us along the, the winding road to, uh, to uh, internet stardom you have today. Crikey. <laughs> well, for many years, I was uh, actually a computer programmer software engineer and my last job I was working at a place called Porton Down in the United Kingdom um, and it was actually a project paid for by the American taxpayer it was funded by your um, Department of Defense um, I can't say any more about it than that because it was classified <laughs> we, were, we were behind the, the behind the, the the double fence and the, the, the armed guards and the guns uh, with the guns and the dogs but um, if I said any more I'd have to kill everybody who's listening to this podcast so you know it's best I don't say too much more but my ex-wife she ran off with this other guy. Randy, she did me an enormous favor, or he did me an enormous favor. And so I was left with three kids and a mortgage um, and no job because I gave the job up to look after the kids because there, well, there was no question what I was going to do. So I thought, what am I, I going to do now? So I started writing. I was, I've always been into writing, you know. So I started writing software manuals for a, a firm up in Cambridge, you know, Cambridge, UK. And they had this most amazing software uh, for designing everything from nuclear power stations to battleships. Uh, it's fa fabulous stuff. And I was basically writing documentation for that. And then, I, as I said a minute ago, I got into Dan Kennedy, started doing more of it for other local businesses, got into Dan Kennedy, realized was, it's, it's not just the ability to write and provide content. It's about, for a good copywriter, it's about marketing as well. Um, so, I, I mean, you can be a marketer without being a copywriter, but you can't be an effective direct response marketer without being a copywriter, without being a, a copywriter. No, sorry, other way around. You can be a marketer without being a copywriter, but you can't be a good direct <laughs> right. response copywriter without being a marketer. You've got to understand it. So that's really how I got into it. And, you know, I work with some pretty big clients from both sides of the pond. Um, uh, and then a lot of Dan Kennedy's platinum guys, I was writing their copy for quite a few years. And in the end, I got sick and tired of working with clients because, as Gary Halbert said, clients suck. Right. <laughs> um, so I just I started doing more of my own stuff, and I became client independent about four or five years ago, which meant I could work with clients if I wanted to, but didn't have to. And now I don't actually work with any clients at all because they really suck. So <laughs> that's it, really. In a nutshell, that's how I got where I am. It's, it seems also very easy looking back, but I'm sure it wasn't. Yeah, it doesn't sound like, especially with having to, you know, uh, support the kids and stuff by yourself. 
Oh, no, I mean, funny enough, I've got my two daughters over here now. One of them lives here permanently, and the other one, she's at university in England. And I was talking to them the other night because we sit up till three or four in the morning drinking wine, which I'm far too old to do nowadays, but they insist. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> they're only 16 and 18. So <laughs> I was talking to them. I was, I was describing how difficult it was because they were, they were only, you know, three, four years old at the time. Um, and I was, I, I would finish a full day, you know, working with the kids and stuff or looking after them. This was in the holidays or even, even on a school day, the kids go to school at maybe nine in the morning and you pick them up again at three and there's not much time to do anything in between. So after a full day of all that, I would sit down to do client work at maybe seven or eight o'clock in the evening and I'd be working till three or four in the morning and then it would all start over again. And no wonder I was always exhausted, Yeah. but Hey, it, 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 <laughs> yeah, it worked, but you know, it's, uh, I wouldn't recommend it, but it's sometimes you just have to do these things, don't you? There's no real choice. Yeah, and I think that, uh, that probably some of these things play together. You didn't have a choice, but yet you got really good at it fast, I'm, I'm assuming. Probably. Yeah, yeah. Now, for people, I'm sure most people listening to this probably know who Dan Kennedy is. Do you remember the first experience where you first learned about Dan Kennedy? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I I was on a – it was in the, in the September, the autumn, or the fall, as you would call it. Um, several years ago, probably 10, 12 years ago or something. And I was looking around, trying, I, I, I can't remember why it was, but I was, it was a teleseminar by a copywriter over at your side of the pond, who's actually quite a big name now. I won't name him because he turned out to be a complete sleazy, well, he's horrible. He's one of the most revolting human beings on the planet. Um, I won't name him because that wouldn't really be fair. But um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you who he is personally to you. But I'm yeah, really, off the air, yeah, yeah, off the air. <laughs> but um, he he had a teleseminar, and basically, if you're a copywriter and you want to get more clients, that kind of thing, how to get more clients. So I went on that, and it was it was actually okay. The content wasn't too bad. It was nothing startling. But one of the books on a, for required reading was Dan Kennedy's No Bullshit Sales Success. So I read that and immediately it resonated with me. So I bought all of Dan Kennedy's books, you know, the next day after, well, that one came, I read it. And then the next day I went on to Amazon and bought the rest, read those by, I think in the November, I booked my place at the uh, March or April super conference. Like this was back in 2005, I think it was, um, 2006. <coughs> I booked myself a place at the super conference, went to that, came back to England, fired two of my three clients and focused on getting the winner of that year's Glazer Kennedy um, Marketer of the Year Award. He was a guy called Scott Tucker, that some people may know. Um, certainly, if, if you look back over Dan Kennedy's history, the last 10, 12 years, you'll see Scott Tucker. So I got Scott Tucker as a client within six weeks. I gave myself three months and did it in six weeks. And from that point on, of course, that put me in the spotlight. So I got loads of clients after that. But that's how I got to, to know Dan Kennedy through a, been reading a book, which is why I'm always telling people one of the most powerful things you can do in your own business is write your own book. That's it's definitely, as simple as that. Yeah, that's definitely been a, well, you just look around at the people who have books and people who've become superstars in the marketing world over the last few years. Uh, and that's become a real thing now too, is the, uh, the free book pay for the shipping uh, type idea that people do nowadays, like Frank Kern and um, Ryan LeVette, yeah. people like that, who more recent people. Yeah, I mean, there's an argument for that. There's also an argument for what I've done in the past, and that's give the whole thing away and pay for shipping. I mean, I can get a, I can get my book in someone's hands um, if I'm giving it away for free for about fifteen pounds, which is what twenty dollars. Yeah, that's not a bad. It's not a bad price to pay for a lead, a very highly qualified lead of a buyer. Uh, sorry, of someone that, not a buyer, not a as a highly qualified lead of someone who gives me their postal address. Right. Now you still conduct a lot of uh, direct mail campaigns and so forth with your business. I don't do so many direct mail campaigns at the moment. I, I really ought to do more. I'm very lazy, you see. Yeah. Because <laughs> I've, I've got this my is a elite. Common thread, I think. This is a common thread of people with that. Yeah, well, I've, I've got my elite group, um, right. and there's my inner circle as well, and then there's everybody else, and I make such a good living, and it's so easy. I'm not feeling enough pain, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, you went through. I, I could <laughs> get up at six in the morning and work really hard and do all these amazing things. I know I could. And I guess part of me is saying, hey, John, you should be doing this. But I'm thinking, why? I'm not feeling any pain. I'm going to get it when I want. I go for a two hour cycle ride. I come home, sit in my, sit in my cave for a bit, play ball with a dog over in the farmyard. 
you know, I don't need to work too hard. It's it's quite shameful, really. <laughs> you, you don't seem too put off by it, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's also true. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, for people who are, because we have sort of, I would say, two audiences. We have sort of copywriters, a lot of which are beginning copywriters, and we have sort of beginning entrepreneurs. And so, hence why we sort of delve into people's past, because I think there is a, a common thread to all the people we've had on this show. They've encountered sort of a tremendous struggle or some upheaval, and then they've sort of fought through it and uh, overcome it. Now, for you, when you were first chasing uh, Scott Tucker as your first sort of superstar client, what kind of things and stuff were you doing to, to, to attract his attention? Well, that was that's interesting because if I look back at it, the task I set myself was rather stupid because I was a Brit, unknown, right. trying to write sales copy for an American audience. So that's just it's just ridiculous. It's tough, but what yeah. I actually did was we were on. Um, I noticed at the time, and this was partly um, coincidental, but it's it's like most things, opportunities there. You just got to keep your eyes open. And we we were on the same fairly kind of secret high level um email discussion group like a google group i don't think it was a google group but it was one like it might have may have been google and it was all done by email and there were always there were people there were people like perry marshall scott tucker um people of that that kind of stature on there there were a lot of big names on there and i i joined that and what i did was i basically saw that whenever scott tucker asked a question i made sure i was there with a helpful answer so I basically put myself there all the while and I just bided my time and um, I didn't market to him directly until and I was, I was thinking, what, how am I going to how am I going to take this to the, to a next to the next stage? Or just, you know, answering questions and things is just is OK, but I need to I need to get a, a, a dialogue going with him. And then fortunately, he put a post on the group with somebody. Can you recommend any, can you recommend anyone to do um, or can anyone recommend a copywriter to do a press release? Because my copywriter is too busy, so I jumped on that one, and he gave me a, a try, and the copyright the, the sorry the press release went completely bonkers. It worked really well, um, and then he says, "Well, then would you write the sales letter?" Because this was basically to promote a well, it, it was to say that he'd won this Glazer Kennedy Award. And then the, on the back of it, he was promoting his seminar. And I did the sales letter for the seminar. We sold out um, $53,000 seat places in nine wow. days. When, wow. And as you, as you probably know, filling a seminar is one of the hardest things you'll ever do. It definitely is. That must have been a And that was it. <laughs> that, that's how I did it. It was basically just appearing wherever he was um, and answering these questions and stuff and making himself look far more intelligent and knowledgeable than I really was. <laughs> <laughs> and until the opportunity to get in there with a, a get a foot in the door came along, if he, if that opportunity hadn't come up, I would have made my own somehow. I don't know how it, it's it's moot now; it doesn't matter. But I would have done something, um, maybe maybe FedEx him a bowling ball or something. I don't know. But right <laughs> now, how long into uh, doing client work did you decide this isn't? You know, Gary Halbert was right. Clients suck, and I need to have my own products and so forth. <coughs> um, I say, my, I, I mean, I always tell people my career really kicked off in 2000. I think it was 2005. I was doing it before that for probably three years, but it was I wasn't really going anywhere with it. So it really took off in 2005. So if we take 2005, it was probably in probably four years ago. So two thousand to about five to seven years, something like that. Right. I could have I done first... it a lot sooner. I could have done it a lot sooner. Yeah, that's why I first probably came in contact with you or, or saw your stuff. I mean, I'm mentoring copywriters now. There's uh, one in my elite group and there's a couple of others. And my advice to them, because these these people are quite are relatively new to the game and they're still really enthusiastic about it. They're still they're really enthusiastic as well because by following the stuff that I tell them to do, they're making loads more money than they ever were. Um, and they're still in love with the idea of being a copywriter. And I'm... I'm absolutely blunt with them and tell them you are going to fucking hate your clients. <laughs> you know, you're going to hate me as well. Cause one of them, uh, this girl, this lady, Vicky Fraser, she's actually a client. I'm her client too. She does a lot of copy for me. And I tell you, and you will, you'll end up hating me. Trust me, you will. Um, because that's what happens. So I encourage them to do their products now rather than wait until they really hate everybody in the world, you know? Uh, <laughs> so they're doing that. So you could do it soon. I think you could probably do it within a couple of years easily become client independent and 
I'm now client free, but it's nice to have the option, you know? Right, because then you well, then you can choose, pick and choose to work with whoever you want. But I'd advise anyone <coughs> anyone listening to this, if you're a copywriter and you've been bitten by the bug and you love the idea of working with clients, it's going to change. I'm telling you now, you're going to hate them. Yeah, I think if you look back, we've had some uh, people on the show here like uh, Chris Haddad and uh, we have Brian Kurtz a few weeks ago. Uh, people like that and it, who's hired a lot of copywriters, of course, and some of the best that have ever lived. And th- there is a there is this cycle, and I think every field goes through this when you become a, whatever it is you're doing, because you take on clients if you're a copywriter. You start off, you, first you struggle. You try to find clients. That's a huge problem, it seems, at first. Then you finally find some. Then you grow to hate those people because, you, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, 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 and that's maybe a... You know, we're laughing at that because it's, life, <laughs> it's but, true. Yeah, it, it is. And, you know, for people listening to this, uh, doesn't mean I don't want to work with you, but the chances are, uh, you know, this is one of those things where it's like there's so many ridiculous things that happen once you take on clients that you must put up with in order to work with clients because they, yeah. they all have our own ne- neuroses. That, uh, yeah, becoming client independent seems to be this, you know, end of the cycle. Like when we had Chris Haddad on here, he talked about how. Uh, I think he runs a course called Escape Hatch, where he, uh, yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah, where he uh, tells you how to you know come up with your first product and so forth, uh, which essentially is get out of client work. You know, get get away and do your own stuff because you'll be so much happier. You have your own business. You won't need to solicit clients and so forth because of the all the problems associated with that. Well, of course, and no matter how much you charge a client, I mean, in my my, my heyday, I was charging. You know, thirty-five thousand dollars for a sales letter and post a few postcards and emails. You know, um, which is a lot of money. I, and but I, I still don't quite believe it now because you know this is going back what, seven years. So that was a long time ago. It was a lot of money. Um, and but even then, no matter how much you charge, you are still trading time for money. Yeah, you're still on a wage, basically. Yeah, and my my daily rate now is twelve and a half thousand pounds plus VAT, which is European sales tax, basically. Um, which is within Ireland is 23 percent so it's, it's not inconsiderable but it still means that if I was to do a job that took me 10 days it might be for you know 125,000 pounds plus VAT but it's still time for money not that I ever would in case anyone thinks I'm pitching don't even ask me because I'm not going to do it <laughs> Fucking hell. I'd rather cut my own dick off <laughs> there's, there's a bullet point right there Jesus <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's true I am um, I had someone ask me a, a while ago, and I, I just thought about it, and I kind of entertained the thought, like a thought experiment. And I just found my skin crawling at the thought of it. I, thought, I just said, no, no, no I, don't, I don't care what the project is or how exciting it is, just forget it. But of course, that's, that's the top end of the, of the clients, people who are coming to you, you know, with loads of money, and they, they want you to work with them. Most, most copywriters, and I'm sure people, if you've got copywriters on your list, uh, listening to this podcast, um, they will have experienced this. You get people coming to you with this great, oh, this is a killer idea. And here's what's going to happen. You write the copy for free and we'll both make loads of money. We'll share it with you. <laughs> uh, if you fall for that, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> because it, it never works out. I've, I've done it before and it never, ever works out. And I, because what happens, what happens is it's one, even if, you, even if they start selling this stuff, you won't get your money because they resent paying you. All you've done is put a few words on the page. Yeah. I had but it's a, a, yeah. it's a terrible, terrible positioning anyway. Sorry, sorry carry on, Dave. No, it is. No, I, it's funny because uh, the more this comes up, I was on a, uh, a big call that Brian Kurtz and Kevin Rogers did here last week for copywriters. And they were talking about these type of things, these type of arrangements that clients and, uh, and copywriters get into because it seems like they're shifting more towards where copywriters are sort of – they're not really uh, in-house. They're still freelancers, but they're only going to work with a couple people perhaps, you know, in a more term relationship. And uh, they had some marketers and some business owners on there as well. And what you just said was entirely true. These people were like, they didn't go so far to say like, do it for free. I think they were trying to, you know, this one lady in particular, though, she kind of said that. And I was kind of like, well, this is this is not somebody maybe you'd want to work with if you're on, if you're on this no. call right now you're maybe uh, jotting down in red, uh, you know. So the name. No, of the- absolutely. I mean, it's <laughs> it's appalling because apart from anything else, from the business owner's point of view, I think it's really bad. Um, it's it's really bad strategy because the people I work with, 
Um, I pay them top rate. I don't argue about it. Obviously, I'm, I want them to do a good job. But I treat them very well simply because if, if I'm doing anything that's building up any kind of resentment, I'm not going to get their best work. I'm just not. And their job, part of their job, as far as I'm concerned, is to make my life fucking easy. And if they do that, I'll pay them almost anything they ask because I love an easy life. It's great, you know. If you could see me now, I'm kind of stretched out in my leather throne <laughs> in, my, in my cave looking over the fields towards the sea in West Cork and the sun shining. Oh, this nice. is... Yeah, this is as bad as hard as I want it to get, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to squeeze people. I, here's a true story for you. Probably a year or so ago, again, I'm not going to name the, the guilty parties, but um, it's someone I worked with many years ago, and I did a great job for him. I doubled his business from a half a million to a million, and then we went into this kind of joint venture on a newsletter, and he stiffed me on it. So I thought I'm never going to work with you again, mate. But um, he was working with this, this young copywriter and this young copywriter chap, he did a good job for him. And then either in lieu of his entire payment or, or in lieu of part of it, he said, well, rather than me give you, you your fee, why don't you let me give you exposure to my list and my friends? And the guy asked me, you know, what should I do? And I said, well, I, I wouldn't touch that with a stolen dick. Right. I would, <laughs> I would... <laughs> I would take my feet and I would never work with them again right. because that is that is just so sleazy it is it's like saying hey I don't really want to pay you but uh, you may be attracted to this opportunity here which is bullshit basically no and I wouldn't treat anyone like that and I wouldn't let anyone treat me like that either it's just horrible well, I think we all, as copywriters too, we all sort of laugh about Gary, uh, Gary Halbert showing up for his uh, seminars and clients suck hats and you know so forth. But and because he kind of was one of those over the top type uh, personalities for the for the average person would see him as over the top. But he was really this is true stuff. I mean, he had you know letters and stuff that he'd written for people where they just stopped mailing because they got bored and stuff like this. You know. Yeah. You got sick of making money. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a terrible, terrible problem to have. Mind you, I mean, I, when I open my boot camps, I always open them with the same line. I always say, I realize what a privilege and honor it is for you to be here with me. <laughs> and it, it takes a while for that one to sink in. <laughs> when people start, kind of start laughing and looking at each other just to say, did he really just say that? <laughs> and bearing in mind, these people have paid, you know, thousand, two thousand pounds to be with me, flown all the way to Cork, paid for a hotel. <laughs> and, then, and then they're being insulted. <laughs> well i think by that time they probably uh you know realize that, that this is how it's gonna go hopefully yeah 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 well i don't want to say again it's about my bullshit filters i don't want anyone coming into the room who's going to be offended by anything like that right yeah yeah exactly because it's just a waste of your just wait till both of your times if they're offended by that guy absolutely now when you first jumped into the copyright you said you were writing technical manuals and so forth for uh nuclear powered stuff and then you went into the you got you got the dan kennedy bug if you will yeah uh, how did you get good at writing copy because i think a lot of copywriters there's uh different schools of thought you know i'm of the opinion you, by doing you get better but well I, that's a really good question to be honest and I, i'm not sure i know the answer one i think is i was prolific i wrote a lot and I, I practiced a lot and I read the books voraciously. I mean, I see people setting their New Year's resolution or their challenge the year to read 50 books. And I find that a bit odd because I probably read double that at least. Right. Every single year. And I've got thousands of books in my house. We have 16 full size floor to ceiling bookcases in the house. Do you have one um, of those sliding ladders? Not yet. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> when I get my new ha when I get my, my dream farm on the top of the cliff, then I shall have the, the room, which is basically a dedicated <laughs> library. Um, that's when you but, really made it, John. That's when you really. Yeah, made it. I, I think so. I think I suppose, But even not having that isn't even causing me enough pain to do it. <laughs> Another thing, of course, is my dad died. As you probably know from my email list, my dad died in November. He left me and my brother a substantial inheritance. Um, so that doesn't exactly suck either. I mean, yeah, I'd rather have the old man here. I'd rather he'd spent it when he was here, but he didn't, and he's he's not. So, you know, I'm not going to turn it down. So that doesn't make my life any more difficult either. Um. But to, where were we? How did I get good? Yeah, I basically, I read voraciously. I studied what people were doing. Um, I'm also a quick learner. But also, if you read my latest stuff, you realize um, I don't actually write sales letters myself, not even for myself anymore. I sell my stuff by email over time. And that makes my life a lot easier. So when I teach people about copywriting, I teach them 
base almost as yeah there are some tricks and techniques you use and you know you want to watch your language and things but i i uh, maybe I, I follow the structure of obviously ADA, attention, interest, desire, and action, and the you know the um, the, the problem agitate solve structure and things. Yeah, of course I use those, but I don't go into the, all the the long winded complex stuff that you would need to to use to go into a say you were writing weight loss ads. You know, everyone and his uncle's into weight loss, so you're in a very competitive market. I don't have to do that anymore. I, I basically sell to people over time by forging a relationship. And the way to do that is to write like you speak. And that's what I do. And I do it through my thoughts of my personality, if you like. So, you know, it's been a long time since I wrote what you would call, in inverted commas, sales copy. It's been a long time. I don't need to do it. I don't do it anymore. I don't bother. The last sales letter I did made probably a quarter of a million pounds for the guy, um, which isn't a vast amount of money. We didn't, I didn't have a massive, it wasn't a massive thing, but. I just don't bother anymore. Yeah. So that's so how- probably not a very not a very comforting answer to most people, but it should be. <laughs> because unless they want to go into these competitive markets, they don't need to learn all this stuff. You don't need to be Gary Halbert if you're just writing um, your own sales copy or sales copy for, a, say, a local travel agent. You don't need that kind of shit. You just don't. Uh, do you think that uh, when it comes to copywriting, I've noticed this myself, but maybe you have an opinion as well on this, I think is uh, do you think that this writing for clients and, and uh, maybe uh, you know, it takes people a long time to end up with their own products or figure this system out the way you have is because there's like an ego attached to like copyright. This is like this being the best copywriter is like a, a, a thing. You know, it's like a pissing contest. It's like a, you know, people uh, continue to write and stuff because they want to, uh, you know, test their metal, even if it's just an innocuous sort of like, I want to see how good I am compared to everybody else. Uh, there seems to be a lot of that within copyright, too. Um, I hadn't really thought about that, actually. I, I suppose you could be right. I, I'm trying to think why I did. I held off to doing it for so long. One of the reasons, I think, was most copywriters probably think they have to write something about copywriting. Right. Or, or, or create a product about copywriting. And there is, everybody's done that. And it's something I resisted doing for for many years until I could put something out there that I thought was different enough from everything else that was out there because the world didn't need yet another copywriting course. It just didn't. Um, but it was, I think it was, for me, it was when I broadened my experience and, and realized there was so many other things to do with running a business and marketing. So now I've got products um, that vary on topics from... Uh, productivity to one on copywriting, posi- positioning and premium, premium, premium positioning and premium pricing. They are what I'm probably known for best nowadays. Um, things like that, email marketing. So there are there are products there that are really nothing to do with copywriting at all. And I think I only started doing those when I changed my mindset and thinking about what I was actually doing. Um, I went from being just a guy who wrote. I mean, I, I was never just a copywriter. One of the secrets to my success, and anyone listening to this should take this to heart. One of the secrets to my success as a copywriter wasn't just the fact that I wrote good copy. There are loads of better copywriters out there than me. I'm telling you that now. But what made me invaluable to my clients was I made their lives easier. I touched on this before. So what I would do is I would write the copy. I would put, I would format it. I would uh, present it as a camera-ready PDF. I would liaise with advertising departments. Um, I was basically, uh, if anybody's watched um, House of Cards, yeah, I was basically Doug. Okay. <laughs> I was Doug Stamper. Anything that needed doing, I would do it, as well as write copy. And that, and you know, when you when you become like someone's right hand man, um, and start making their lives easy, you get your feet under the table. You become invaluable, and it's they, that then that changes the whole game because uh, you then can charge anything you want. They won't query it, and because you're apart from anything else, your fees are incomparable with anyone else's because they don't do, you know, you're not just a copywriter. You're a right-hand man who also writes copy. So when I kind of started doing that, I obviously necessarily needed to expand my skill set. Uh, and I just started doing, I think the first thing, the first product I did was probably an internet marketing sales thing, which which is well, I'm probably going about five years now. And it's well out of date. I mean, we talked about things like SEO and stuff, which is probably well out of date now. Um, but the point is, it was, when, it was only when I stopped thinking like a copywriter so much that I realized that I didn't have to create a copywriting product at all. There's so many other things out there. I think there's about 12 or 13 different topics 
distinct topics that I'm I can speak on and write about and create products for authoritatively. Right. Now, when you got <clears throat> you sort of have uh, I think how I found you was probably because I was looking around at different email marketing people who I thought were doing it because I I first learned email marketing from Matt Fury. And uh, then eventually I found people like Ben Settle yourself. Yeah, and Ben's a good friend of mine. I like Ben. There you go. And people, we've actually uh, had his uh, his copywriting apprentice, quote unquote, on the show, uh, Jody. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, that's funny. <laughs> so, <laughs> we us. But uh, yeah, how did you first get into uh, sort of the way that you do it now? Um. That's a really good question. I started, I mean, I was writing daily emails probably about the same time that Ben started. So maybe 2006. It was just before I moved to the to Ireland, I think. So 2006, 2007. Um, and it really started, I started writing it the way I write it uh, as soon as I started deciding that I wasn't going to put up with anyone's bullshit anymore. <clears throat> and I just started writing as I was writing, as, as I like to write. Um, so it wasn't really someone you'd come across and sort of say, oh, I see what he's doing here. It was more you just started doing it that way. No, no. It was, I think I got the idea for writing a daily email was it from a guy called Craig Garber, I think. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I know who that is, sure. I, th I think that was the first person who switched me on to daily emails. But the style I use um, predate, I mean, I didn't get it from anyone. I mean, the, people like Ben Settle, I came across Matt Fury long after I'd started doing it myself anyway. Um, so really, it was to me, it was a bit of a no-brainer. It's something I've discovered uh, in a in a parallel fashion. It was like parallel research, I suppose, parallel discovery. Well, that's like, interesting. Yeah, I think that this is the way that uh, you know. There's many people do it different ways, of course, but I think that's probably how I found you originally. I was looking for other people who are doing similar things uh, with their daily emails and just writing as you speak. It's it's more of a conversational story, and you also learn about the person. Uh, yeah. I mean, the interest, the most important thing it is to be really authentic. I mean, I hate people using that word sometimes. I talk about being your authentic, authentic self. <laughs> people who, people who say that need something a, else. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they need a punch in the face for saying things like that. <laughs> but it is, it is important to, to express your your real personality, because I had one guy. Um, he's he got the bug to do it, and he started doing it, and he started writing like me. But he's not like that in real life. So when it came to um, what speaking on the phone uh meeting in person to talk about projects and things or even one-on-one -on -one emails it wasn't the same so there's, a, there's this kind of like a cognitive dissonance of you are this person on your daily emails but then you are this person in real life and that that is uncomfortable for people because you don't know which one's the real one then you you start to think ah is this guy's it when's it you know you don't you don't verbalize it like this you don't think it through in this way but the, the, the feeling you get is there's something not quite right here yeah, like he's like he's like there's maybe he's lying to me or so you get that initially yeah. right up right up front. Yeah, it's like people who are always nice all the time. No one's nice all the time. <laughs> and when you meet someone who is, all you know is that sometimes they're lying to you. You don't know when that is. <laughs> yeah, I hate people who are nice all the time. <laughs> yeah, you find if you run into people that are quote unquote too nice, you start to think, what? secret are they keeping <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> exactly what have you got around the back hanging from the pecan tree <laughs> <laughs> well uh so how do people get a hold of you john i mean i i found you years ago but if people are getting a hold of you now where do they go and how do they how do they get on your list <clears throat> well the probably the easiest way is to go to uh grow your business fast.com that's the, it's not my own, it is my website, obviously, but there's johnmcculloch.com, but then I'd have to spell it and people won't, won't <laughs> listen to that. So if I, I mean, I think everyone listening to this can spell grow your business fast. If they can't, they don't, you shouldn't be getting my emails anyway. <laughs> so it's growyourbusinessfast.com and you'll see my handsome face and you can join my email list and take it from there. But please don't, don't contact me asking for one-on-one -on -one mentoring or, or client work. So I'm just not interested. Right. And you have, you hold regular events uh, where you are in Ireland? Uh, well, not as regular as I ought to. My last one was in 2014. Um, I'm I should I'm hoping to do one if I can be bothered, probably in May. Uh, but you know I don't need the money, and I'm also working. I'm not going to say anything about it at the moment. But I'm, I'm working on a big project 
uh, that anyone who's a freelancer, etc., would want, would want to know about copywriters themselves. Um, perhaps, perhaps actually, yeah, that's probably quite a good plug. Thinking about it, it's it's something really big that people who are anyone who's a freelancer uh, of any description, whether it's copywriter or uh, graphic designer, or anyone who's in a business selling B two B, where it's to your advantage to teach your own customers and clients how to sell to their customers and clients because the more they sell the more they buy from you and anyone who just wants to really learn how to um, market their businesses properly uh, if they join my list if they go to growyourbusinessfast.com i can assure you they will get to hear of it nice awesome that's coming up in the, in the coming months yeah it'll be launching in june um yeah it'll be launching in june and then there'll be an event in september a big event in september awesome. which will be all part of it awesome <clears throat> So get and on that, that would be in, that would be in that Dublin. List, it would be in Dublin, Ireland. Okay, there's an excuse. There you go. So uh, that's how they get a hold of you. There's a bit of a cliffhanger there. It's something a big upcoming. I just wanted to say thank you for coming on the show, uh, John. You've given a whole lot of knowledge here today. I don't even people have, probably won't even realize it. I'll have to listen back to this a couple times. I've been making notes myself on how uh, clear and sort of direct uh, you put things which are really important. And I just want to say thanks for coming on. I've been a big, uh, big fan of yours for a while now. I'm so glad we were able to connect. Well, thanks for inviting me. I've enjoyed it. I always do enjoy this. I ought to do it more often, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, you really should. Cause you got a lot, <laughs> you got a lot to share. You've been through a lot. You've done a lot, I think. Aye, right, that's true. Well, thanks for coming on the show, John. Cool. Uh, You're welcome. Thank you. I also like to thank uh, Ben Sound at bensound.com for the intro and outro music. And we'll be back. And I think Carlos will be back next week with us. I uh, can't remember who we have on the show, but you'll have to tune in and find out because it's always interesting people. Talk to you guys later.